No mai, hari mai, kia ora. My name's Tim and welcome to our fifth panel of the Emerging Futures Summit. Today we're talking about how do we turn waste into value and we have three exciting guests with us. Uh, we have Jason Herbert from Mint Innovation, Dr. Christian de Groot uh, from <clears throat> Unitech, uh, a tertiary institution here in New Zealand based in Auckland, and Anna Yollop uh, from uh, the general manager of Bioresource Processing Alliance. So welcome to you uh, panelists and welcome to you the participants. I'm gonna ask each of the experts uh, just to introduce themselves. And again, we're gonna be focusing on this overarching theme of how can we turn waste into value? And each of our experts bring uh, their expertise and experience uh, to try and answer this question. And I encourage all of you to get active in the YouTube channel, uh, ask those questions, and we'll be peppering them in as we go. Uh, so experts, uh, please introduce yourselves and tell us one thing that you're most excited about uh, in this space. Starting with you, Anna. Uh, so I'm Anna Yallop, um, the General Manager of the Bioresource Processing Alliance, or BPA, I'll refer to. And we're a government-funded research and development fund, and we basically take biological byproducts and waste and secondary streams from the primary sector, so horticulture, um, aquaculture, forestry, dairy, meat processing, that sort of thing, and turn them into high-value products for export. And I'm really excited about the fact that um, companies are starting to realise that uh, they've actually been throwing away some things that can be valuable. And they're starting to think about doing more stuff with with their byproducts. Fantastic, Chris. Yeah, yeah. Thanks, man. Um, so I'm Dr. Chris De Groot. I, I teach undergrads and postgrads in uh, product design, uh, communication, and interaction design, with a special focus on sustainability. Um, and so, in a way, I'm here to try and stimulate the next generation of uh, creative and sustainable thinkers and makers and the thing I'm most excited about is um, is that the circular economy makes uh, makes a whole new world of uh, strange and exciting materials and uh, products possible mm. we wouldn't conventionally think of um, of, uh, of using second third fourth hand materials or other strange combinations when we're creating uh, new consumer goods or industrial products. So, yeah, for me, it's a it's kind of a whole new lease of life on the design industry. Fantastic, cool. And Jason, hi. So uh, my name is Jason Herbert. I'm the business development manager for Mint Innovation. Uh, Mint Innovation. We recover gold from electronic waste using bacteria. Uh, these guys that we use as the sponges to sponge up gold. Um, I'm most ex excited about our tech because our tech is is a pretty next generation. It's the future. Uh, we're using bacteria to grab gold and precious metals from a waste stream is, is pretty, pretty freaky and scary, but we're doing it. So that's what I'm quite excited about. Fantastic. So I, I hope you agree, uh, participants, we've got the, the right people at the table to help us answer this question of, of how do we turn waste into value. And Chris, it would be great if you could frame up uh, this I guess, what is the circular economy? What is turning waste into value? What does that look like? Awesome, hey, thanks for the question. So yeah, the circular economy, most people hadn't heard of it until maybe a year or two ago. It's, uh, it's effectively the new way to, uh, the more advanced way to start thinking about a sustainable economy for the future. Um, and in a way, it's a little bit complicated. Hopefully you guys out there are reading this definition. This is your kind of classic Wikipedia definition of the circular economy. And I guess the most important thing to get from this slide is that we're trying to minimize uh, any kind of wastage and any kind of pollution and create the most uh, efficient and effective form of an economy possible. And that's moving away from the old style industrial economy. And in a way, um, Nature, left on its own, is the perfect circular economy in that everything that is born or that is all the new products that are made, the leaves and the flowers, they do a job and then they fall off and then they, and then they hit the, uh, the forest floor 
and they rot and they become nutrients and uh, in a sense uh, another form of value to another customer. Now humans are never going to, well, hmm, not for the foreseeable future are they going to get as efficient as nature. However, three important principles for us to remember when we're starting to uh, look for ideas and or create new designs in this circular economy space are to design out waste, i.e. to get rid of it, and to try and uh, design out pollution from our system. Uh, to keep all as much of the products that we create and the materials that are in them, to keep them in use. Okay? So again, we're trying to minimize throwing stuff away or downgrading or degrading it. And finally, if we're going to come up with new things, new ideas, new, go new goods and products and services, we want them to somehow aid the natural world, not to take away from it. Now, this here is the classic diagram that describes the principles of the circular economy. Now, you'll notice two kind of uh, serious sets of loops, one in one color, one in another color. Those loops are the return cycles. The vertical arrows are the, the stages of, in a sense, traditional making something. Um, and those different uh, arrows that come around, that's how we return, uh, recycle, bring those materials and those products back into the production system. It looks a little bit complicated, so I'm going to very quickly just take us right back to a simple starting point and build uh, back into that complicated diagram. So conventionally, in, um, uh, I guess, 20th century industrial thinking, we have a take, make, waste, or dispose model, i.e., next slide, um, we, uh, we take material from the ground or from, the, or from an oil well, right? We extract materials, then we make something, could be a toaster, a loaf of bread, a pint of milk, or a pair of shoes. And then someone's going to use, consume, and finally dispose of those. And they're going to end up being burnt or, or going in the landfill. Now, the problem with this model, of course, is that we take all this good material, we use it for a short time, and then we throw potentially polluting but definitely useless materials back in a hole in the ground. Now, we've all heard of recycling, okay? So if we think about... Uh, some of the simple items that we, we can recycle uh, might be a, an aluminium can or uh, maybe you, you give a jumper or a pair of shoes to a, to a friend who could, could use it. These are ways to perhaps uh, prolong the material um, that goes into a product. Let's have an, another slide. Now, the interesting thing is, uh, can we go back one? Yeah. Now, the interesting thing is, if we take a simple plastic bottle, you might buy it, drink the water that's in it, and you think, right, if I put this plastic bottle into the recycling bin, it's going to be recycled. However, because the plastic in the lid might be a slightly different version of plastic than in the body, it's got a different coloring as well. It means a lot of variations of even one plastic type get mashed and mingled together. And that downgrades the quality of the mm. material. So, yeah, we can reuse that plastic, make another plastic bottle, or maybe even a beach ball. But the quality of that material goes down successively. It cascades down. Now, glass, on the other hand, Every time we, uh, we smash the glass bottle in the recycling bin, it gets taken back to the glass bottle manufacturer, and they'll make another brand new glass bottle. And it's actually really simple for them to separate the clear glass from the green, from the brown, from the black. And so it's, it's practically an infinitely recyclable material without any downgrading in its quality. In fact, one of the interesting things about glass is uh, glass that has been recycled actually melts at a lower temperature than raw sand 
from the beach, which you would turn into glass. There's about 100, 150 degrees difference at the melting point between what they call collet, recycled glass, and sand. So actually, using recycled glass is better than more using efficient. new material. Let's go on. Yeah. Um, so from here, so we've got the simple principle of downcycling or upcycling, but what happens when we find uh, a material, let's say, that isn't a product at the end of its life, but instead is a is perhaps a waste stream or a material that is being discarded uh, as a as a function of a production process. So sometimes uh, a factory might be giving out heat or steam from its chimney while it's making something. Well, what could you do with that heat or that steam? You could probably power a small village, generate electricity from it. Um, in the uh, in the honey or beehive industry, the number one product is of course honey, but there are all sorts of other products and um, valuable outputs that, uh, that bees generate, which for a long time were ignored, things like bee venom and, um, and, other, and other elements. So one of the critical things for you in this challenge is gonna be looking for where are these almost free uh, sources of material. So it could be at the end of use, i.e. being recycled up or downcycled, but it could be a waste stream or a byproduct of an existing process. And maybe that uh, maybe that's somewhere in your local vicinity, in your in your geographic area. And you can then do something with that byproduct or that waste stream. Anna, do you have any uh, good examples that you might think of uh, at that juncture of a, of, a pro of a product that's come from a waste string? Yes, um, so one example is uh, we're working with a company who takes organic matter, whether it's um, food, could be brewery waste, could be um, horticulture waste, any number of things, and breeds black soldier flies um, to eat the organic matter. Then you harvest the larvae, and it becomes a protein source. So um, that's that's a really useful way of getting rid of a lot of landfill um, waste that probably would either go to landfill or go to stock food for animals mm. um, and then create a product at, at the other end. That's one example. Yep. How about those, um, you were telling me the other day about the, that brewery yep. you were working with and they, they, they created a, a very uh, different sounding product out of one of their... Uh, Byproducts. Yes, yeah, so we work with a company who, um, by the time a brewery finishes with their um, their brewing process, they end up with a lot of spent grains, and traditionally that goes to um, make sort of soy sauces and um, marmite and vegemite type things like yeast extracts um, or stock food, and they make tons and tons and tons of it. Um, and we worked with a company that was inter um, interested in making a sort of little wee dog biscuit for that. So we made a, a treat for dogs. And they knew of a company who was uh, in the States also making, um, from their spent grains, I think it was, a, a plastic um, top for holding a six-pack of beer that is edible. So that if it ends up in the waterways, um, animals like turtles that traditionally would get caught up in the plastic um, can actually eat this um, byproduct and it dissolves or gets eaten or breaks down eventually. Yeah, it's amazing. Uh, I particularly like the, uh, the the dog biscuit, but the edible um, <laughs> uh, beer pack holder sounds great too. So, um, are, are, are they examples of of, of two? There's, there's obviously a waste stream piece here, but also a new product. Oh, totally. Yeah. Yeah. And it's all about um, for a lot of those companies, it's about the the complete story. So it, sometimes it can cost a bit more than just getting rid of the um, byproduct as they normally would, giving it away or selling it for a very low value. So it costs money to do these kinds of things, but it's more about building a sustainable story for companies. Mm. So just on that, Anna, what what you're what you're saying is that the the companies are recouping that cost in other ways. So it's, it's either adding to brand value or it's it's a, coming out of a marketing budget, perhaps. 
Yeah, and, and more and more customers are expecting this kind of behavior. So they want they don't want to hear that a company's dumping dumping stuff or it's going to landfill or it's polluting or stuff like that. So it has a lot of um, value to, to do something with it. Um, so for, for some companies, it's about building a nice story. Um, for others, it is recouping costs as well. But it's good if you can get a double whammy there. Um, so on this slide, I just wanted to also uh, identify for all our participants that um, most of the time when we talk about the circular economy, we're looking at um, tangible products and services and processes that, uh, that keep energy and materials flowing around the system. But you can also think of um, designing or developing opportunities to engage the public or to engage the customer, which is not necessarily a circular or, or a recycled product in itself, but it's a, more of a symbolic, artistic, uh, or almost like advertising way to try and drive uh, a change in, in uh, people's behavior and to raise awareness around the issue. So I've just put here uh, those classic recycling bins with their very colorful flags. Those we, you know, we're starting to see them pop up everywhere and they really are a way to help um, remind people that they've got a they've, they've got a duty to do something with the with the packaging that they're consuming, and so I've highlighted that in green. Um, but we can also think of other places in the system where we can do some form of communication, art, sculpture, uh, an event, some anything like that. A form of engagement which helps um, raise awareness in the in the in the wider kind of public arena around their role in um, in recycling, reusing, and what have you. Now, just very quickly, just to return to this circular economy diagram, there's one other thing that's quite important to remember is that for materials and resources and products to be able to return back into the system of human uh, manufacture and consumption, we can't afford to mix natural and artificial materials. We can't mingle them up. Uh, that's when we end up with um, what we might call uh, Frankenstein products. If you think about, let's say, uh, the soles of your shoe, perhaps, or uh, a soccer ball, you've got a situation where you might have fabric, rubber, plastic, cotton thread, all glued up into kind of one lump. And you can't very easily peel those things apart anymore. And because you can't peel them apart, you can't recycle them very effectively. They just end up as, as, uh, as, as chips to stick under the tar on a motorway if we're lucky. So remembering to um, either just work with the biosphere, just with the technosphere, that's artificial materials, or to at least recognize that we need to separate them at the end of the product's life cycle. That's really important. One, one thing that's coming up from the participants, Chris, is mm -hmm. that this example of how to use old uh, car tires. And one of the participants is saying, well, car tires make a great uh, vessel for packing earth into and, and building houses from. So is this an example of, I guess it's not a mingling of the, the biosphere with the technosphere, but it's, how would you treat that example? That's quite intriguing. I was actually going to bring up a slide with car tires uh, in a slightly different way. But um, in situations like that, uh, it, I guess it's still possible at the end of the life of the house to wash the adobe or the, or the, or the, or the clay out of the tire and put the tire in one pile to be uh, reprocessed and put the clay or the earth in, in another pile. That's possible. Now, one of the interesting things about car tires is that in many parts of the world, it was, uh, it was deemed a really good idea to shred and chip car tires and recycle them because it's a big problem, car tires, okay? We've got mountains. To shred them and turn them into um, uh, the kind of bouncy surface for children's playgrounds. Hmm. But, of course, car tires 
have usually spent the better part of a hundred thousand kilometers in close proximity with other car exhaust pipes and all the dirt that accumulates on the road so it turns out that if you want to give children cancer the best thing to do is take them down to a playground which is made of old car tires <laughs> right so we right. also have to be a bit careful about the materials that we recycle and reuse interesting so again thinking it, it's one of the themes that's coming out through the summit is this this idea of having to think more holistically about mm. the product or the opportunity and think upstream but also downstream in the, the life cycle to ensure that we're not doing any unintended harm indeed that's very true jason can i invite you to share your perspective and the story behind mint absolutely i'm more than happy to yeah so um, just in Mint Innovation, we are pioneering a world-first technology where we recover gold from electronic waste from printed circuit boards, waste print circuit boards, um, without, uh, without sign up, and we use microbes to do that. Um, I'll build the story. $142 billion worth of gold will be dug out the ground this year alone. 20% of that is used in your electronics. And each and every one of you over 10 years will discard two kilograms of gold through the electronics that you use. I know, it is unbelievable. So unfortunately, as, as Chris has uh, alluded to, that there's actually no real way to recycle electronic waste or printed circuit boards well. Um, there's, there's three options for them. One is they go to landfill where they leach into the ground, they leach cadmium, lead, all this toxic material. The second option is they go to uh, the illegal trade where they're traded illegally. They go to the developing world like China, Africa, all over where they get burned. They get put in acid baths to recover the gold out of them. And the third would a small minority go to these massive mega smelters, which require hundreds of thousands of tons to just remain profitable. And these smelters are throwing up all sorts of dioxins in the air and polluting where they are. And they're also very expensive. So only five or six smelters in the world can actually process electronic waste. Um, correctly and have the necessary technology to to, to do that. So uh, next slide, please. So what we aim to do is we want to build plants that are essentially based on our, our technology using bacteria to recover the gold. And these plants we built at point of collection for electronic waste. So Melbourne, uh, if we build a plant in Melbourne that will recover about $30 million worth of gold per year. If we scale up a plant and go to California, for example, we'll be able to recover $300 million of gold. And these plants are really cheap. They cost $5 million to build, $20 million to build, $20 million to build for a bigger one. Uh, next slide. So the technology that we're using is we're actually using bacteria um, as, as these sponges to go into solution and kind of as if absorb the gold and wear a gold jacket around themselves. And bacteria, they have done this for billions of years. Uh, it's theorized that <clears throat> in the beginning, when the Earth, like four billion years ago, was moving around through all these asteroid fields and gathering all these heavy metals, gold being one of them, bacteria had to figure out a way to actually clean its environment. And one of the ways it did that was to bioabsorb metals. And just so happens we found the right one that bioabsorbs gold. Um, so kind of as a business, next slide, please. Uh, as a startup, we so what the essentially what the gold the microbes do is they go into very low concentration solutions where we've kind of grounded up our electronic waste or printed circuit boards and they concentrate it up a thousand times so from you know 10 ppm to thousands of ppm they wear this gold coat and uh, so pa parts, parts per million right parts per million yeah and concentrate up at 10 like you know a thousand times to a point you can actually recover it and this is novel technology, and novel technology means we can patent it. So we've patented it and built a very strong patent portfolio around this technology, uh, which allows us to essentially, you know, birth the circular economy for, for an area that doesn't have it right now. Uh, next slide. You're like modern, modern day gold miners, Jason. We, I, I think alchemist is a better term for what we're doing because we are taking waste to gold, essentially. Um, the, how our technology works uh, is we partner up. So printed circuit boards have a recognized value around the world. People recognize that they're gold-rich material. We partner up with those e-waste aggregators. Um, then we grind up the waste into a, a fine powder. Um, and then we have a recyclable solution that goes into, and we essentially strip all the metals off. We have two different uh, leaching leaches that we do. Um, and we use recyclable solutions so we can use the solution over and over again without having to discharge it. 
Um, the first stage was we get all the base metals, like your lead, cadmium, off the off the plastic, and then we're left with gold bearing plastic, and then we essentially create a lixivian out of that with some more solutions, and then we contact our bugs to that, and the bugs gain this purple color, um, and that purple color is is what gold looks like in nanoparticulate form. So that's the wavelength that gold gives off in nanoparticulates. Um, and then we burn off the bacteria. Don't feel bad for bacteria. They don't feel it. It's very quick. And then we're left with nuggets like this. Uh, this nugget was recovered today from a 10 kgs of waste that we processed in our pilot facility. And we also recover copper as well. And that's recovered from today. Um, next slide, please. Oh, sorry. Next slide. Oh. So the the kind of the cool thing with our tech is is actually isn't it's high tech, but it's low tech in its operations. And we want to build uh, the kind of these plants that look and feel like microbreweries. They're, they're simple vessels. You can build them anywhere in the world. Build them quickly, and they're cheap to build. So you know, at your hometown, we could build a mint plant and start recovering valuable metals and close a, a vital economy loop for you, a circular economy, and actually bring metals. Um, that you may not have in your area. Um, we're essentially, in case in point, so when we have a plant built in New Zealand, we'll be able to offset 12% of copper imports from New Zealand alone per year, just from the amount of copper we're able to recover from uh, electronic waste. Uh, next slide. So what are, uh, yeah, so where we are now, so we're a startup, so we're kind of gearing up to go full scale. Um, we've just raised $5 million to uh, build our first commercial plant here in New Zealand. That commercial plant will process 200 to 500 tons of uh, electronic printed circuit boards per year, recovering about 40 kgs of gold. The next iteration of that is going to be a commercial plant which will process 3,000 tons, and that will recover 600 kgs of gold per year, 600 tons of copper, and 60 kgs of palladium. Uh, next slide. If there is a next slide, yep. So the idea is that because we're so simple, we're going to take over the world and we're going to build a plant near you, hopefully soon in the next five years. And and, and the, the, the most important thing about this is that we are recovering valuable metals that, you know, copper, a, a big part of our circular economy is, is copper. And in a hundred years time, copper will be stripped out from every single mining area in the world. There actually will be no copper left. So we have no choice but to get better at recovering it, and we recover it, and we'll be able to recover it at your doorstep. Um, the final slide, I believe there's one last slide. So this is what everyone gets excited about, the amount of money that we could, could potentially make. And this is from a circular economy. So this is closing a loop and you know changing from you know we make something, we use it, then we waste it. We're actually going to close this loop and just con constantly remanufacture electronics. And out of that, we're going to be able to make, if in 10 years' time, we'll be able to address 8% of the market, which is just about a billion dollars, is our goal. Um, and and hopefully, uh, other companies will start to follow into our footsteps and start to understand how they can recover waste. And that, that is Mint Innovation for you. Fantastic, Jason. As a, as a source of comparison, mm -hmm. what, are, what, do, what do the financials look like for a, a gold miner or a metal miner like how do you compare uh, so so a, a metal miner is going to have to you know like if they want to go mine gold they have to it's all very dependent on the gold price they have to go and find massive amounts of land so you know gold mine is going to set you back 400 500 million that's before you even get into you know the capital equipment you need to mine it and if the gold price changes overnight to say you know goes down three or four percent you have to close the mine down because that's it your margins are so tight because all the different equipment and at the end of the day you still need cyanide to recover gold from mining and and for it we, we've run some numbers and for every ton of printed circuit boards you recycle electronic waste you recycle you offset about 30 tons of carbon monoxide from mining um, right so so it makes it makes sense you know there's actually enough material out of the crust we actually don't need to mine anymore wow Okay, so I mean, there's, there's not only is there the, the financial opportunity, but there is the, the climate impact uh, yes. contribution. There's, there's this social kind of recognition of, of limiting the, the downstream harm of, of cyanide being used in, in local environments and the impact that could have on, on people and farmland, etc. So it strikes me that back to Chris's opportunity diagram of of waste product, byproduct, or new product. There, there are so many examples. And Anna, I'd, I'd like you to perhaps start to elaborate on a few more of uh, examples uh, 
perhaps in, in the waste stream or the, the, the byproduct uh, area? Uh, so we work with a whole range of, of byproducts. So to give you an example, of, um, there's a there's a, a pest species of seaweed that's in New Zealand called Undaria, and it grows on mussel lines when um, when aquaculture farms are growing mussels. And so when they pull up these um, lines that have all the mussels on, there's just meters and meters of this plant called Undaria, which is a real nuisance. So we did projects looking at what value could be got out of of the of a nuisance species so that um the the people who harvest the mussels can also get some value out of the end area so it has some interesting bioactivity that um, people are interested in looking at um, other examples are things like um, bark from the forestry sector so you have mountains and mountains of bark or sawdust that are made into um, just piles and it becomes a bit of a problem um, particularly if you have um, a, a fire something like that. Uh, so what we've been doing is making biofuels, so making them into um, briquettes, which are an alternative to um, coal or um, cutting down firewood. So that's another alternative. They're long burning sort of um, materials there. Um, other examples are things like um, taking seconds from fruit from the horticulture industry. So some of the products um, aren't good enough to export overseas as a, as a raw material. So you might take the seconds and make a, a, another product out of that. Um, or it might be um, processed. You, sorry, is, is there an example of, of, of taking the seconds and turning it into a product? Uh, yeah, so things like kiwi fruit. So, okay. Um, Kiwi fruit is really well known for gut health. It's got interesting um, enzymes and things like that in it that are really good. So um, a big company in New Zealand, Zespri, they export um, the raw material of the, of the kiwi fruit. And then um, the ones that aren't sort of up to scratch or look a bit funny, um, they go to other companies, like there's a company called Vital Foods and a company called Anagenics, and they basically make gut health products, so functional foods based on those byproducts from other people. Can can I ask Chris a question just around points of entry into, you know, is the startup cost, Jason's talked about, you know, new mining, there's this $500 million capital investment plus buying machines and, and, and all the, I guess, yeah, that capital required to get going. Is is there a a rule of thumb that says actually waste stream uh, economies are, are easier to enter into, or is that is that not true? Um, I, yeah, I don't know if they're always necessarily easier to enter into, uh, because there may well be technical challenges involved that are that require some you know very serious uh, expert knowledge or the invention of new processes that uh, that that mint innovation is a is a prime example of. However, um, I guess one of the one of the rules of thumb is that if if it's somebody else's um, rubbish, that you can see some uh, proverbial gold in, <laughs> then uh, then it's likely that it's going to be very cheap. If not free, possibly. possibly. Um, <laughs> which, which, obviously, yeah. It and and that can change as soon as somebody else realizes that you see value in it. Then obviously they're going to want to an exchange of value, an exchange of value, or they will want to share in that value creation. Um, but okay, certainly, uh, sorry. You know, even if you just saunter or go for a go for a, a kind of a wander around around your your local industrial. Um, area or you know the kind of place where there's factories and other manufacturing um, uh, venues you'll see just just by walking or driving through those areas you'll see a lot of material just being pushed out of the side out of the back door the side door the front door um, and whether it's little bits of metal that are off cuts timber Fabric, rubber. Um, so, Chris, what you need to do is put your your gold glasses on and and start to see see that waste through gold tinted lenses. Anna, do you wanted to jump in there? Yeah, I think a challenge that we come up again again and again with is that companies 
are in the business of making their primary product first. And then whatever comes out of that as a waste or a secondary stream never takes as much priority as the primary product. So you really struggle to get the um, resource in a company to give it the full focus, whether it's getting a product to market that's from a secondary stream, um, marketing it in the first place, um, doing the R&D. So this is a challenge that we come up against a lot, and that's where products sometimes fall down for us. I'm just talking about companies who have a core, have core products and then want to launch another secondary product. I'm not talking about companies who make their core product from other people's primary product, if you know what I mean. Sure, sure. Sure. Okay. So, are there are there any other challenges that, apart from potentially, there's some new technology and in, in innovations case you had to do the research and and prove that the the bacteria could scale and your process could scale. Are there other challenges from your experience, Anna or Chris uh, or Jason from from your journey to actually make traction and and get going? I think from our experience it's it's been quite it's been quite eye opening to to just like because we're dealing with computer manufacturers and understanding computer manufacturers and and they they have very little interest in recycling their their um their waste streams. Oh and I think the biggest challenge we face is just education in terms of what electronic waste is you know we approach a lot of people and be like oh we're covering electronic waste they're like well what is that they have no idea what it is and then you say well it's your computer and they're like oh but i throw my computer out in the bin that's not electronic waste and you're like no 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 no. that that's exactly what it is and and the, i think the challenge that we've been the, the kind of the, the we've seen the most is just how do we tell people about the circular economy and how do we make it so simple that people can understand that it, this is not a waste stream. This is a potential revenue stream. And how do we change the definition of a waste stream to a revenue stream and and convince people that there's actually value in that waste stream that you've called waste for many, for decades. You've called this waste, but it's actually not waste. It's something else. It's revenue. So so take as as Chris said, walk around your local industrial area and you'll see piles of waste. You know, what is the barrier to going up to that producer of that waste? And saying, "Hey, can I can I grab that, please? Can, can, I, can I do something with that?" Trick? You'd be so, oh, sorry. Yes, or, or Jason? Yeah, I, I, it's you know, as as Anna was saying and Chris was saying, is that you know these are secondary products, and people just want to get rid of them. And a lot of times, people will either pay you to take it away, or they'll just be happy to be like, "If you want it, take it. Just just I'll open up everything. You can have whatever you want, and take it away." It, it's 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 it, they they're happy, you know. They'll pay. They'll pay for you to take it away. Uh, and what? Are, yeah, exactly. Oh, go on, Anna. Yeah. Um, I see some different things there um, because I find at a, a research and development level, everybody's really happy to give you a few tons or a few kilos of byproduct. That is a problem for them. It's when you then want to commercialize it yes. that it becomes challenging because, as Chris alluded to, suddenly something that. Um, gets taken away for $10 a kilo, suddenly if a company thinks that another company is going to make $100 a kilo out of that, they get dollar signs and start getting free. So it can be a bit challenging there. Um, and also companies don't want to upset what they do already with their with their byproducts. So if they've already got a, a stock feed manufacturer coming and collecting it, for instance, they don't want to suddenly go, oh, this company over here is going to make lots of money with our byproduct. I'm going to make more money out of it. I'm going to send it to them. And then that company falls over and then they've sort of, you know, been usurped the other people. So they really have to think carefully before they, um, they chop and change with what they're doing. Sure. Well, I guess the... And and you're totally right. And I mean, there's a, and there's those are what you might call uh, commercialization issues. But in a sense, that's a nice problem to have because you've got you've uh, by that point you've taken some kilos, some hundreds of kilos of waste. Uh, you've developed a prototype. Um, you you've figured out the systems by which you can either remediate, clean, harvest, uh, and re-engineer that into something of value. Now, if that organization doesn't want to deal with you because it's going to upset their current system, then 
then the, the likelihood is that there may well be another organization who has a similar form of output somewhere else. If not in your country, then certainly somewhere else in the world. But um, yeah, it's an, it's a, I think if, you can, if people can uh, identify what opportunities, or at least what, either the issues that are out there or what, are, what other material opportunities uh, exist, then that's, that's one place to start. In some ways, it's much more difficult to start by uh, to what you might call um, start with a high level approach, which could be, let's say, I want to design some clothing and I'd like to do it in, an, in a circular economy style way. Because what you'll, what you'll then need to do is to start figuring out, well, you have to go back down to the bottom, bottom up thinking, go, well, where am I going to get materials from? What, what so color are they? Orange? Oh, well, I don't like orange. So <laughs> in a way, it's a, it's, you've got a tension between top-down thinking and bottom-up yeah. thinking. Can, can you expand on that? Cause, and perhaps Anna or Jason, you want to jump in with some examples because this is really the points of entry to the problem. We've, we've spent a bit of time looking or thinking about just looking around and looking for piles of waste. Are there any examples of where, you know, top-down or, or in-state thinking has worked? You know, like Jason, in, in the gold case, is, did you start with, hey, we want to produce gold uh, in a more sustainable way. How can we do that? I, th I think it's uh, our idea stemmed from a company. Um, so we we are <clears throat> our company started off uh, after a company left New Zealand called Lanzatech, and Lanzatech did something very similar, which is they use microbes to turn waste steel gas from gas mills carbon monoxide into ethanol. Um, the first Virgin Atlantic plane is about to take off with their fuel that's been converted into jet fuel. So they've got fuel that's been essentially from a waste gas gone through from a fermentation process of microbes, turned into ethanol, and then turned into jet fuel. Um, wow. And the, I think for, for, from, that, from that perspective, they started with an end product of like, what's something we can sell, a, a commodity, and that was ethanol, and what's a waste stream that may potentially have ethanol? And they were like, well, carbon oxide can be you go through fermentation to become ethanol. Um, and, and Mint approached it very much the same way, which is, you know, what's a valuable commodity and, and, and gold tends is the highest one. And what's a waste stream of electronic waste printed circuit boards? They've got gold in them. And then what technology can we develop that essentially gets that value and recovers that value into gold? So I think kind of the, the way to think of it is if, if you find a, a final product, if you will, that's got some value to it. Trace it back to a potential waste stream and see what could, what it, what it would take to become that product again. Is kind of the 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 thinking that we did around Mint, which was <clears throat> start of something start of something with value. What's a waste? What's a waste stream with that value in it? Connect and, the dots. and connect the dots between it. Absolutely. Anna. Um, <clears throat> an interesting company called Green Spot Technologies. Yes, I know Green Spot. They're amazing. So Love they um, basically saw, so they use a fermentation process mm -hmm. and they um, saw that there was a lot of um, what's called pomace, so basically waste pulp from the fruit and vegetable processing industry. So if you're making um, fruit juices or products like that, they're left with a, a pulp and it's very nutritious still. So using fermentation, they, they got all this tons and tons of pomace and they turn it into, it looks a bit like a flower. Um, like a, an, so it's ingredient basic, basically, and it's um, low sugar, high fiber, low GI, low fat, um, sort of alternative that can be used in sort of um, baking smoothies. Um, it's high protein as well, which is really unusual for for a plant based product. So they started with that in mind, uh, and they've just moved to France where they're um, they're setting up their uh, plant there. Um, another one is New Zealand King Salmon. So that's um, that's a company that exports salmon. They, I think they do about 50% of the world's um, Chinook salmon, if I'm not wrong. Um, and they set up a, a division called Omega Plus. And that was interested, they were interested in, um, in looking at um, a pet food range from the byproducts from the king salmon. So they, they set out with that goal in mind of turning it a product that would normally be made into fish oils or fish meal 
into a much higher value product? The, the, the connecting of the dots, it, does it always require high tech? I mean, are there some examples of, of really basic uh, connection technologies? Oh, trying to think now. No, we've we've got products. Um, we've got an avocado powder that is again okay. an avocado pomace after you make avocado oil, and that's just dried. Um, right. Drying, drying takes up a lot of energy, though, unfortunately. But that's a low tech, effectively a low tech compared with other things. Um, opportunity there. So in in that case, Anna, you've you've got a company that's trying to maximise the value out of out of the primary resource is well, we, we squeeze the avocado to create oil and then what can we do with this byproduct and they see rather than that as waste they see it as a, as a secondary uh, value stream. Yep. Chris d d can you think of any examples from your teaching around where, where you don't need to have a high-tech lab or be connected to a university and, and do essentially what Mint Innovation has done is find a very specific bacteria to do a specific task. Yeah, for sure. I mean, there's a there's a real kind of classic example, which um, which some of the audience might might not, in a sense, remember because its its heyday was probably about ten or twelve years ago. Um, there was a uh, a, a well, if, if you if you know the uh, the kinds of bags with the diagonal shoulder strap, we used to call them courier bags because cycle couriers cycle. Cycle couriers in big cities would wear them to put envelopes in and deliver them to the other side of the town. And uh, a German company started making them out of discarded uh, 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 truck uh, vinyl siding. Ah, uh, right. Um, that's right. I know so, the company. Yeah, called Freitag. So that's, that's the German for Friday. And, and, uh, they're incredibly expensive bags, Chris. They are now. They are now because they've all become collector's uh, uh, editions, interestingly. And secondly, is there is no longer any, um, there's no longer a, a reliable resource for the, uh, for, the, for, the, for, the, for the tarpaulin that comes off the side of a truck. Most of the other people who tried to copy Freitag actually had to make their own fake recycled uh, truck tarpaulins. Right. So that's why, unfortunately, we first of all, it's really simple because they would just collect up all these things that were otherwise going to get thrown in the bin, cut them into rectangles, and sew them into bags. So there was almost no no change in the in the production system. I was going to say, and it's a great example of, of where rather than you know we've we've had some nu nutrition examples, we've had commodities from from Mint Innovation, and there's a fashion uh, like output wear bag and I assume there are also some clothing Anna or, or, or Chris can you think of any clothing companies that are that are actively recycling materials what does when I mean, you see strange and wonderful things gonna crop up in your blog feed every day like uh, it wasn't it was only a few weeks ago I came across a clothing or a fashion company that were, was making a a, uh, a form of fake leather out of the um, the yeasty scoby you find in a kombucha brewery right so, i mean bizarre to think that some kind of rubbery bacteria blob could be <laughs> could be flattened out and turned into something that looks exactly like leather but uh yeah uh and quite I simple spent, um, apparently. i spent my family and i spent a couple of months living in iceland and oh. um i bought um some chokers and wrist um, things that were made out of chicken's feet. Right. <laughs> it sounds like a horror movie. It is. <laughs> <laughs> Only in Iceland. That's, that's the last thing of fashion that sounds like. <laughs> but still. High really, fashion, Jason. High fashion, high, look at me. I don't know what high fashion is. <laughs> Just high fashion. Yeah. I guess, high fashion. Uh, yeah, exactly. Yeah. One, one question that's come up here is... It, and it, this is more of a, a recycling, but actually just taking old clothes. Has anyone just taken old cotton and, and turning that cotton into something something else? Uh, well, you I... do get people doing kind of, you know, mix and match secondhand sort of op shop style. 
but I think it would be quite interesting to take old clothes and actually just uh, turn them back into um, cotton fluff. The problem with the problem with uh, um, used clothing now is that uh, with with the advent of fast fashion, there is so much uh, used clothing available. It is no longer worth collecting it. Right. Uh, it has it has no monetary value as a raw material in the first instance, which is great. Which is, means it's free. But uh, at the moment, it's too much of it. It's filling up warehouses around the world, and um, not enough. There's not enough ideas to do stuff with it. But uh, actually, so that's a great idea. It's, yeah, that's a really good idea. And of we've course, got a, we, we, it, we, it gobbles up so much water. Um, this is cotton. Cotton gobbles up a lot of water, Chris. Yeah, it takes a very significant proportion of the world's water supply. So this is where we get these these relationships between our, our big wicked problems, and and that by by actually taking a, a waste stream or a circular economy approach to problem solving, it, it's one way to actually contribute to. Uh, reducing our impact on of, of climate change, oh, uh, mitigating climate change, and you know, with the events that are happening in the world at the moment, these big storms that are brewing, you know, looking at these problems as as opportunities, one to fundamentally uh, make some make some money where there is an opportunity that no one else has seen, but also contribute in a meaningful way uh, to reducing our impact uh, is massive. Now, look, we're, we're coming to the the end of the session, and participants, please get your questions in there. Um, because we would like to get some of them answered. One of the questions from earlier in the session panel was around just building waste. And this, you know, when we build our buildings, there is inevitably, I, I'm building a house at the moment, and there is so much waste that comes off the site. Is anyone doing anything with that waste? Oh, there's a company um, on the radio the other day, they're doing deconstruction of houses. Okay. Um, so it's mm. just started, and they'd like to get within ten years. They'd like to really scale it up and get teams of people taking part houses and recycling them. Yeah, I mean, I, certainly, I think we're seeing uh, all the early signals that uh, the construction industry uh, it will need to um, to be doing something very significant in the near future. There was a, an analysis of the Australian construction sector uh, as, a, as a career pathway just a month ago, and it identified that uh, demolition people in, the, in, uh, in Australia are the highest paid form of builders hmm. in the construction sector over there. Which Why is, is that, Chris? Well, I guess uh, those guys have got to knock stuff down real fast and just and get it out of the way as soon as the developer says, right, let's go. Uh, so they're working in very dangerous conditions and and they're also, they have to deal with all this stuff that typically uh, no one wants. Um, I think once you get to the point where the pain is enough for companies in terms of regulations or costs, they're just going to do what they do. So in time, if the regulations are such that it is just too expensive, um, to just keep dumping stuff, you know, that's got to change. So, so what you're saying there, Anna, is that at, at the moment our economy allows us, and we, we talked in, in the climate change and even the, the, the social change panel around externalities, and I can imagine, Chris, you talk about externalities and, you know, these design life cycles as a really big thing. Um, and our regulations allow for us to essentially ignore the waste. Yeah, yeah, it's not part of a, a designer or an architect's um, scope of responsibility, really, uh, at the moment. Although, interestingly, of course, uh, in uh, in Europe, if you're designing a battery-operated product, it is now your responsibility, and you will have to take it back. From the customer, or make that make that option available. So right. we're so starting on the side. Yeah, yeah, that's the W triple E. Um, yeah, yeah, standard. 
Yes, yeah, so Europe, Europe's kind of the gold standard for regulation when it comes to you know re re retaining resources or recovering resources, and their 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 kind of viewpoint is that if it's manufactured by a company, that company is responsible for it's the end of its life as well, the EOL. And so in Europe, companies have to manufacturers who import it actually are responsible for collecting it and and um, and discarding it safely and breaking it down or recycling it. Mm. But what we're finding, uh, especially at Mint, is that um, is that people, because it's so expensive to actually go through the whole process of collecting it, they just put it onto a container and ship it abroad to the developing world just to get rid of it. Um, so, so regulations are, are part of the answer and part of creating pains around, around companies, but most companies are, some companies aren't going to, they'll find ways around the system as they always, as some companies will and people will. And so that's when innovation has to come in. That's when you have to be innovative and find out a way, uh, okay, the regulations are there. How can we be innovative to actually, you know, make this economically feasible? Because when you make it economically feasible for companies, that's far more attractive than the regulations. Absolutely. Because, absolutely. Look, I, we're, we're going we're gonna to end on a, a surprise question for the three of you. Um, if you were to put yourself into the participant's shoes and you had 10 days to work with a team of, of diverse people from around the world, what would you be choosing to work on around waste stream and circular economies? Jason, do you want to jump in? Yeah, I'll jump in. I, I would, I would, if I were in your shoes, the next big thing is lithium, lithium batteries. Um, there's, there's currently no real way to recycle them, and 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 it's going to be a massive problem in the future because everything around you is powered by lithium-ion battery, and everything cars are powered by them, and they're notoriously difficult things to recycle because the lithium is somewhat got quite explosive properties to it. So. I, if I were in your shoes, I would absolutely love, love to find a way of how do we, even if technology doesn't exist yet, what are ways we could start to think about how do we how do we recover lithium from the waste streams we're generating today? Um, okay. Is that that will be the next the next issue we have to deal with in the next five ten years? That's a great one, Chris. Um, I'm going to cheat and have two. The first one would be. <laughs> We've we've already kind of uh, identified that cotton um, and uh, and or used through clothing. That's a great one. That one. Yeah, yeah. That that, that um, I'm really just to see that one. Yeah, but I think um, I, I'm really excited about some of these uh, current initiatives to sending out uh, autonomous drones into the Pacific or other oceans that collect up all the the uh, the throwaway and waste polluting uh, microplastics that are out there floating around and ending up inside seagulls. So designing those kinds of devices that scoop all of that stuff up on the beach or in the sea, that's cool. And then what do we do with it? That's the question. Yeah, um, I think that's that must be fascinating because a lot of that plastic is probably quite um, sort of broken down and maybe a little bit old. What do we do with it? It's got to be something interesting. It's a good question. I like that. Anna? Um, I don't like food waste across the board. Um, so anything that you can do to uh, reduce food, because all the work that goes into making it in the first place, the energy, the water, time, money, um, is, is good from my perspective. And there's a demand for it, of course. Um, so healthy, nutritious food for, from my perspective. Um, and I guess if you go looking, look for things that either save companies money or make money for companies. And I think it's part of the problem sometimes we get, uh, sometimes I talk to people who are like the sustainability people in companies and they're all, almost quite awkward about talking about making money from byproducts. And I go, but be proud about it because you're never going to sell it to your company's board if it's just a sort of, a nice idea. If you can save money or make money for a company, you've got far more chance of making it happen. Fantastic. We're going to leave it there. Thank you so much, uh, panel, for, for joining us and taking us through such an interesting discussion. Participants, there's so much material in this conversation, but also online to really uh, prompt your thinking and, and problem solving. 
get into Slack with your teams and, and really start asking that question around what are the opportunities just in your local surroundings to start looking for waste and, and turning that into value. We'll see you again in an hour for our final discussion uh, on cultural diversity and how that can be so useful for problem solving. Kia ora, thanks very much, and we'll see you shortly. Bye. Bye. Yeah.